next speaker, John Fitzpatrick, is a graduate of West Point, the, the Long Gray Line. So um, some people are frequently between jobs. Fitz is always between trials. Here's a typical situation. Your adversary makes unreasonably high demands and refuses to settle a catastrophic injury high exposure case, putting your company and your career on the line as she marches to verdict in a judicial hellhole. Are you really selecting trial counsel when you merely accept the next one up in the queue at your regular law firm? Is that a, a wannabe trial lawyer, motion practice litigator they've given you, someone who hasn't been to verdict in a decade? And is he miraculously going to develop trial chops in times to save your company? Are you getting the protection you need from a professional who's been through the firestorms before? Please welcome trial lawyer John Fitzpatrick from Denver's Wheeler Trig O'Donnell, who makes the case for the proposition that all trial, trial lawyers are not created equal. That was a hell of an introduction. Uh, I didn't write it, but anyway, good to be here. Um, I'm 20 years in here. I owe much of what I've been able to do are the wonderful relationships I've met with people in here, most importantly with Alice Mursky. God bless you. Uh, it's been quite a ride, Alice. All right, so my topic, are trial lawyers fungible? Class action, patterns, everything say, don't we settle 98% of the cases? Do we really need a trial lawyer? Dear God, do we? Let's see. Well, what's fungible mean? Um, being of such a nature, one part of quantity can be replaced equally. Are lawyers truly fungible? It's too bad I had a, it was a rolling thing. I had like eight different lawyers and I ended with Ellis, but there you got Ellis. Did Ellis make a difference? I think he did when you look at the people we have in this room. All right, so who are our clients? General counsels of corporations, insurance companies, they are risk averse. They're risk averse by definition. They want to avoid trial at all costs, sometimes regardless of facts. Why? Time and money. Risk to reputation. Punitive damages. People panic. Bad PR. Judicial hell holes. Dear God, there are a lot of judicial hell holes. This idea that your jury is going to be your peers, let me tell you, you go to some of these judicial hell holes and you'll have a cumulative IQ in that jury of about 50. Hmm? Uh, fighting bias. Do you think they like corporations? Who wants to be for Wells Fargo? I mean, seriously. And the guy comes up and he made how many millions of dollars in the stock options? But he fired all the other people that he was trying to incentivize? I mean, that's what we face. All right, so what's the answer to hopefully cover someone's behind? Hire a big firm. Okay, so what do you get with a big firm? Huge rates, legions of, I call it, associate groups, and my favorite, focus groups. Awesome. Focus groups, we're going to take a three-week trial, and in one or two hours, you're going to get everything you need to know. Seriously? Are you kidding me? Who's going to play the plaintiff in defense? Well, we got a good associate. He's going to do whatever. You're kidding me. Uh, damages? I love that. Well, let's just see what they would award. The plaintiff wants $25 million and they say 10 What do you think, lawyers? And the lawyers say, come on, give them up with a number. And they come to the middle, and you go, oh, my God, we got to settle. It's funny money in a focus group. But yet people live and die for a focus group. Can you get some themes? Yes. But in the end, your big firms and a lot of people have few, if any, I call trial lawyers. What are plaintiff's theme? You know what you're going to see. It's not a secret. Profits over people and safety. We're going to hear it. So come up with a good company story. Embrace your company. I like to say, I represent GE before they release they didn't pay taxes. I represent GE. We got 340,000 people who pay taxes. Like I said, before they didn't pay taxes. But you got to come up with a story. And what are you going to find out when you're doing like a product's liability case? The corporate documents will feed the flame. Your marketing division says what? Maximize profits. You know they'll be in there. And science says we got to beat the competitors, rush the market. And your VCs, your venture capitals, we want profits. Those are the documents you're going to have. That's not a good story. We know that. And then your 30B6 witness, I don't have time to prepare. Oh, I don't have time. And they're like a deer in the headlights. So that's who you're defending. All right, judicial hell holes. God love you, Roger. We got some places in East Texas, as you know. San Francisco, Philly, Madison County. Why does every class action get filed in Madison County? I don't know. 
Vegas, Baltimore City, I guess just you get such a fair shake in Madison County. And what are the plaintiffs doing lately? Discovery wars. They want to create sanctions. They don't want facts. So now it's, did you answer this? Did you file this? Did you have a decent uh, affirmative defense, which is going to distract from your weak liability? You better have someone who knows how to do that. And settlement, sure, settlement's always at least a good option. But if you don't have an experienced trial lawyer that's going to allow you to, I say, negotiate from a defense of strength, position of strength, carry a big stick, uh, or this is before he got really <laughs> like this, uh, Kenny Rogers got tight as a tick. You got to know when to hold him and know when to fold him. Anybody see that guy? He's like, that Kenny Rogers? Hey. All right, so here are five questions you got to ask. I just thought Kim Kardashian had everything done, but apparently Kenny did too. All right, and, and folks, it's your money. So I, I defer to you. But your money, what questions do you want to ask if your chestnuts are going to be in the fire? How many cases to verdict have you done in five years? Just verdict. Ask them the question. And they go, well, we're all trial lawyers by trading. Well, I've tried them over the years, but they most settled. Man, have I gotten a good settlement. I was ready to go to verdict, and they pulled the rug out from under me. Well, that's fine, but my question was simply, how many to verdict? You didn't answer the question. There's a reason. Okay, second, have you tried a catastrophic high exposure case? I'm not talking about a liability where you're just an agency or maybe you're in for a couple mil. And they say, you know, trying a case is like riding a bike. You never forget. Really? Would you take your loved one and you got cardiac surgery? You're going to say to a doctor, what? How many surgeries have you done? You want to go to a cardiac interventionalist? How many stents have you done? Well, I've done a couple, but you know the heart's all the same. I'm a cardiologist. Really? I mean, would you not run? And by the way, a trial is not a politically correct experiment. You're not having a jury of your peers. You may have a cumulative IQ of 50. And you're going to go, well, let's get the right sex and the gender and the looks and whatever. They don't care. They hate corporations. You better have someone tell a story and know how to charm a jury. Irish. Um, <laughs> Otega, O'Connell, Fitzpatrick. All right, trial experience. You ask, I ask to talk to their clients. I, I love when I get some of these files when I get brought in a couple weeks before, and you read the files, and they say, we're going to win, win, win. We're going to bill you, but we're going to win. It's 80, 90% winning. And then a month before trial, it's 50-50. Now, what the hell is 50-50? That's the biggest cop-out. It's the lawyer can't lose on that. Oh, he could win, I could lose. Why do I hire you? I could win or lose. Aren't you supposed to bring some value? And then they get in trial and they start to collapse. They go, geez, we better settle before it hits the papers. We're going to hit for punitives. All hell's breaking loose. And then you pay $10 million and he says, I saved you 10 You could have been hit for 20 I mean, that's who you want in trial wars? Could be. And then you say, you know, we got great facts. Why are you telling me we can't win? And I love the excuse. Well, it's sympathetic. Well, who's not sympathetic? We got a brain damaged kid. We got someone with no arms and legs. You know, remember that? Dude? Who's that arms and legs and a patty? You know, but I mean, infections. No arms and legs. How'd you like to do that? Someone who's paralyzed. Someone's got brain damage. We've burned. We've had an explosion at a power company. You have four or five people horribly burned. Well, there's going to be sympathy. But can you turn on and tell a story? Or they say a bad judge. Well, we've had eight years of Obama appointing them. Do you think it's going to get better? I mean, we've got tough judges. You better be ready to go, and you've got to defend a corporation. That's what we're trying to do. Or they say the juries won't understand science. Really? Well, ask the lawyer on the spot. I talked to a finance a big company that had a big class action, and I told him once before he heard it, the talk, he says, ask the lawyer to give you a 10-minute opening. Two years, a huge firm, I won't tell you the name, had had this big class action securities, and she, and she came up, lead trial lawyer, to talk in front of 10 of the board. And dear God, you know what he said? He says, give me a 10-minute opening. Choked. I, I, I'm not ready. I don't have my stuff. You've had the case for two years. What's your opening? We're going to trial in three months. Give me a 10-minute opening. Couldn't do it. Ask that. 
I don't give up pucker factor. And then say, how many cases have you tried and won? Winning, you heard from Joe, winning's like really important. <laughs> it really is. I know it's a novel concept, but they say, well, I don't keep statistics. Really? <laughs> well, it depends on how you define win. Okay. You know, but I mean, ask them, have you won big cases? All right, so give an idea of, of just some, I think what trial lawyers can do for you. I had a case, uh, Gun Hill Dairy, 18 farmers were suing the power company, saying stray voltage. Okay, that's not good. Nine years, it was 90% defensible, had the best expert, uh, millions in fees. On the EVA trial, panic set in because they said no jury's gonna turn out these wonderful dairy farmers. Okay, so the cows were harmed by stray current from a power plant. The amount of power plant in a grounded electro that sent electricity to LA less than what you turn on your laptop today, travels 18 miles from the grounded electrode, goes to the cows while they're drinking water, comes back because you got to complete a circuit, and they don't drink as much. So they have less milk production, although these are actually producing more, or they have higher death rates, although their actual death rates are less than the average. So there's that lovely power plant, like it's in the middle of nowhere in Utah, and there are the Dairy farms. You see the grounded electrode and somehow it goes underground for 18 miles. Can you imagine if a lightning strike? Holy cow, how does this earth stand there? But yet this is what happened to the 18 farms. That's the theory. Here was a, the main guy, a union electrician. Not a, not a no degree, nothing. 100% of his living was he always found stray voltage when he tested every farm. He never tested a farm he didn't find one. Imagine that. He did no testing to confirm it, but he says, look at that power plant back there. Of course, he was getting galvanic, if you've ever done those old tests. The cows weren't doing well, and he had all these terrible damages. So you did a little search on him. Larry the legend. That was his license plate. Okay? A union electrician, he failed his exam eight times. When I crossed him, I said, you failed it eight times? He says, well, I'm blind in one eye. I said, well, do you give your customers a 50% discount when you do work? You know, and I went, oh, Fitz, that's kind of harsh. I said, wait a minute. He charges full deal. Don't give me this, I got one eye. And he says, oh, I've got great experience. I've tested 1,500 dairies, and I average between 42 and 77. So I did the math. I said, dear God, you've made 9 million. Oh, I don't believe I have. Well, I said, you've either lied on how many you've tested, or you've lied on what you told me how much you did. And then he would sell these traps to try to fix it. But he says, don't worry, sue the power company, because you'll get it all back. So we did a little search on the guy. We found a little recording of Larry talking to a bunch of farmers. Would you like to know what he said? This. So it is a money issue. Stray voltage is a money issue. It isn't about what's right or what's wrong. It is about money. Who? You want to know? Now, you think that goes over great with a focus group? You want to do that in front of a real jury? He's dead. Dead. I said, what happened to that? Well, I was just talking about general things. OK. So I said, let me look at your data. You got all these pieces of data. They're called fluke readings. And here's what he did. All right, you see up there on the far, your far right. He doesn't even zero out the right time. He's got 1995. He was doing this in 2002 to 2004. But notice the time, 7.40.32. The bottom is what he can type in, the manual legend. I got a voltage 390 ohm resistor. Oh, it looks like I got the same, but I have a new type in legend. I have now an open circuit voltage water. Huh. And then, oh, a third one. I got a yet a new one on a different date. And you put them all together, and don't they look the same with three different explanations? So what, I, what did I say to him? And again, you can't do this in front of a focus group. I says, no. The duckworth dairy, this is a waveform to determine the frequency base. You have the same picture, and you gave it three different explanations. I said, is that just sloppy, or is that fraud? Now, you, you got to picture this. He's up there, and he goes, it's sloppy. Now, do I care what he says? Seriously? I mean, just the thought where he had to think, let me see, is it fraud or sloppy? <laughs> but again, a focus group? <laughs> that doesn't happen. Okay, again, when I say tell a story. All right, a guy, we're having a lot of stroke cases. 
bad things happen. So you start saying, is it rare? Okay, how rare is rare to a jury? Because let's just say the doctor I was defending really wasn't licensed. Eh, it happens. And uh, may have had some other personal issues with drugs and alcohol and sex. Eh, it happens. So I decided I think we better focus on causation on this case because my guy is not one that you'd take your dog to. Um, anyway, um, the occurrence rate of a vertebral artery dissection, 1 in 150. He had head trauma to the front of his head, but remember, this is in the back. So without any neck pain, it's like one in a million. Standard of care, not so good. I'm going to focus on causation. So what could I have done to prevent this guy from stroking out? TPA, which is a clot buster, or a retrieval device. That's what I had to do. The vertebral arteries in the back, pretty protected. All right, so what's my theme? I do this all the time. When you hear hoofbeats, do you think horses, not zebras? I had this in front of a jury, think of those lovely horses, not the freaking zebras. Okay, so here are the doctors when at least, when you get one in a million, the various doctors who testify, I've seen four in 13 years, never seen it in 38, one in 13, never in 31, but they're expert, sees three or four a year in Casper, Wyoming. I said, holy cow, they got white zebras, they're albinos. I got to go to Casper to see this. You're amazing, doc says I. Now, to give you some idea of the arrogance, and you pull that out, but again, a trial lawyer can do that for you. And dear God, we got some wonderful people here. I said, before you ran a single test, you told him and his wife, if you had just called me, I could have prevented the damage? Is that what you did? Well, I don't recall the exact words, but uh, yeah, kind of like that. I said, so, and I read one of their own scripts basically said, would you agree it would be reckless to tell anyone that you could assure a good outcome with this? And he says, he's reading it, it's 100% inappropriate to do that. Well, I said, so you just admitted you were reckless. Okay, so how, how arrogant was he? He had told everybody, if you just called me, including his own people. So here was my question. I said, so everybody that touched him, including your own neurosurgeon they called on the third, the hospitalist, they all blew it? If only they had called you, you'd have done it. Is that what you came to tell the jury? Five people blew it? God bless him. He said, yes, that's what I did. <laughs> and on that, the judge was about 5, 10. He said, you know, on that note, let's 5 o'clock, let's take a break for the night. We'll see you tomorrow. That was a good ending. So here's what he could have done differently. TPA, clot buster. This is what's included. Did I tell you he had head trauma, crushed his head openly? It's a contraindication. But he'd have done it. All right, so I said, so you'd still recommend it? Yes, I'd agree. I just read your own protocol. It says you wouldn't do it. It's an absolute exclusion. Well, I wrote them. I guess that'd be true. I guess I could violate them. I said, good. So I said, let's look at your stats. What's good? We got their stats. Here's the national stats. Brain injury or death, less than 6%. Well, Doc, here's what you've done. You've got four dead out of 40, two in hospice, probably not so good, nursing home at seven and a half, and long-term acute at five. I said, you know, I, I need to know how that informed consent would go. Nationally, 6% die, but see, I kill about 400% more. You know, but I feel lucky today. What do you think there, Mr. Lee? I mean, I sent him to acute care, but I'm, I'm feeling good about this. I mean, you could see the jury looking at him. He was dead. And then my favorite. We could have done a retrieval device. We're going to go get the clot where he stroked out in his head. I got a stipulation from the guy who was on staff said, I've never done one of these. Okay, let me see what that was. This is what we're going to stick in your brain and pull out the clot. Oh, sure. I oh, can't wait for that one. How about the only study on this? The New England Journal with uh, the Mayo Clinic, 50% death mortality. Sign me up, I said. I said, Doc, I'm all for that. Check out those long-term care. I said, that's what you're going to do? So it didn't matter what my doc had done about drugs and sex and whatever. The point was the guy had had a stroke that there was nothing anybody was going to do. But again, you hear hoofbeats. You don't think albino zebras unless you're in Casper, Wyoming. So nothing beats trial experience, as I like to say. I think change is good. You've got some marvelous people in this place. Um, but it's your money. You decide. I know that. But you better get someone who is not afraid to try a case. And I would have had a few more Irishmen, but these are the only two I could get on there. Uh, I have hair. He's the tall one without hair. Um, 
but thank you very much. Privilege to be here.